Good evening, everyone. I'm Michael Ulrich, director of NYU Washington, DC, and I am thrilled to welcome you to tonight's event. So why are we here? A little background. In the early hours of June 28th, 1968, 1969, excuse me, only blocks from NYU's Washington Square campus, the Stonewall Riots began, proving to be a turning point in the modern LGBTQ plus movement over the ensuing five decades. NYU faculty, students, administrators, and alumni have engaged with this movement, contributing to groundbreaking change, but at times experiencing heartbreaking loss. 50 years later, NYU is proudly sponsoring a series of events to help us reflect on the remarkable social, political, cultural, medical, and legal transformations that followed Stonewall and continue to shape our community and our university. For our event tonight, the John Bradamus Center of New York University is proudly partnering with the Victory Institute for a conversation and celebration of 50 years of LGBTQ progress and political representation. The Victory Institute is the only national organization dedicated to elevating openly LGBTQ leaders who can further equality at all levels of government. Through their training and professional development programs, each year the Victory Institute assists hundreds of individuals who go on to influ influential careers in politics, government, business, and advocacy. Many of their trainees join the more than 1,000 openly LGBTQ plus elected and appointed officials now serving around the world. I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker, Sheila Alexander-Reed, the director of the DC Mayor's Office of LGBTQ Affairs. Sheila is a community activist in the truest sense of the word. Her work to shed light on issues affecting the voiceless among us cut across every line that could divide us, gender, race, socioeconomic status, education level, and sexual orientation. She was formerly the Director of Strategic Engagement at the Washington City Paper, Vice President of Strategic Initiatives at the Washington Blade, Founder and former Executive Director of the Women in the Life Association, as well as host of Inside Out DC's only FM LGBTQ radio show, which aired Tuesdays on WPFW. In addition, Sheila formerly served as the Vice President of the Gertrude Stein Democratic Club and represented Stein on the DC Democratic State Committee. Sheila has championed causes for young people, women of color, the LGBT community, and survivors of domestic violence. Please join me in welcoming Sheila. Thank you, Michael. Well, hello, everybody. How are you? As, uh, as you just heard, I am here representing Mayor Muriel Bowser. So let me um, give you her remarks, if you will. But first, let me tell you about the Victory uh, Fund and how amazing they are. And about 20 years ago, they trained me in the Victory Institute on how to run an LGBTQ uh, successful campaign. And so ever since then, I've been a fan. I'm proud and honored to be here as a part of that group. And I um, really um, remark at, at their success over the years and how many candidates we have, including um, several women of color or several women. Let's just give a round of applause for the women elected lately. Thank you. Mayor Bowser would be proud of that. So let me just um, segue into the proclamation. Whereas an uprising at the Stonewall Inn in New York City following the police raids of June 28th and June 29th, 1969, launched the modern day liberation movement for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer Americans. And whereas in the decade following the Stonewall uprising, LGBTQ people joined pride marches in New York City's Christopher Park and in cities all around the country which culminated in the first ever National March on Washington for Lesbian and Gay Rights in 1979. And whereas we remember Washingtonians like Frank Kameny, who saw the Stonewall Uprising as a galvanizing moment, one that could be used by succeeding generations of LGBTQ Americans to demonstrate pride, bring awareness to discriminatory laws, and recall the stories of trailblazers like Marsha P. Johnson, who have, become, who have come before us, and whereas we pause today to commemorate the semi-centennial of the Stonewall Uprising and acknowledge LGBTQ Americans still face an unprecedented level of discrimination and harassment, especially transgender youth and women of color. The Stonewall Uprising is a reminder of how far we have come and how far we must go until full equality for the LGBTQ community is achieved. 
And finally, whereas the government of the District of Columbia and every Washingtonian have made diversity, inclusion, and fairness our great city's legal, cultural, and social foundation, over the next 50 years, we should recommit ourselves to fighting for a city that fully protects and includes LGBTQ people, especially those on the margins. Now, therefore, I, the mayor of Washington, D.C., do hereby proclaim June 28, 2019, as Stonewall Uprising Semi-Centennial Day in Washington, D.C., and encourage all Washingtonians to celebrate the courage, perseverance, and sacrifice shown that day 50 years ago and to continue being champions for inclusivity and equality for all. Mayor Muriel Bowser. And now I have the good fortune to introduce uh, the next guest. Uh, this is Ambassador Michael Guest. Uh, Ambassador Michael Guest is a senior advisor to the Council for Global Equality, which is a coalition of organizations promoting LGBTI rights abroad. He previously served as America's first openly gay Senate confirmed ambassador to Romania from 2001 to 2004. He ended his 26 year diplomatic career in De December 2007 after having sought without success to end the State Department's discriminatory treatment of the partners of gay and lesbian foreign service officers in foreign postings, and then worked successfully on President-elect Obama's transition team to change these policies. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Michael Guest. <laughs> Ambassador Michael Guest. I shared the title long ago, and no, you don't need to call me that anymore, but thank you, Sheila, not just for the introduction, but also for your commitment and your activism. It's very much appreciated. And thank you, Michael, uh, NYU, and Victory Institute for inviting me to be part of this, this evening's conversation. Uh, I think it's important that those of us in the LGBT community know and honor our history. And it's important for all of us who are Americans and who are taught from the time of childhood that we believe in principles of equality and fairness and justice uh, to know about Stonewall as well. So I, I, I'm assuming that everyone here knows the basic history of Stonewall. I won't go into it. Uh, the police raid that night in Greenwich Village, the outrage that built, the protests that spread across the country. Uh, I would think it's fair to say that no one who was involved in those raids that night could have imagined what would happen. They were just out for a night of drinks with friends in one of the safer places that they knew. And no one could imagine at that time that 50 years later so many uh, out LGBT people would run for office and win office. Uh, nobody could imagine the Victory Institute, the mission that it has in training out LGBT candidates for their work, uh, both in running for office and in succeeding in those jobs. Um, so this is an evening to celebrate Stonewall's impact uh, in the participation of LGBT people in politics and in public life. And in just a few minutes, you're going to hear a pretty amazing panel talk about how much America's political representation changed in the time since and what that means for a country. Uh, I was not a politician. I was a diplomat. And so I'd like to share with you a few thoughts about what Stonewall has meant for me personally and what it's meant for the way our country is presented abroad. So I joined the State Department in 1981. Uh, and just a few years before I joined, you still could be drummed out of the service for being gay. They considered that a security risk. And so in a very real way, because of Stonewall and because of the federal protections that it led to, I was able to enjoy a career and pursue my calling. But we've lived through Stonewall's backlash, of course, as well. And I see some of you with gray hair uh, so you know exactly what this has been like. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, our government turned its back on uh, men who were deprived of their jobs and who were dying because of AIDS. Uh, Anita Bryant was doing her Little Miss Sunshine Tree routine around the country. Uh, our government was ramming through legislation like Don't Ask, Don't Tell in Doma. And our country's first nominee, out gay nominee for ambassador, Jim Hormel, uh, was denied that post by the Senate. And those were national headlines, but for most of us in the community, they were personal as well. 
Uh, my mom and dad supported Anita Bryant. My best friend died, to, died of AIDS. And uh, when Jim was defeated in his quest to become ambassador, that took away the safety that I'd always felt uh, as a State Department employee. Jim's defeat came three years before I was nominated as ambassador. So you might imagine that a lot of my colleagues and friends urged me to go back into the closet. Uh, and they urged me to leave my partner, now my husband, behind when I would be going abroad. Um, now, they were concerned about my confirmation, I understand that, but they also bought into the narrative and into the messaging that an out gay man couldn't be effective as ambassador, particularly in a homophobic place like Romania. My instincts were entirely different. I knew that I had a professional reputation on Capitol Hill, a lot of friends there, a lot of people on both sides of the aisle who had worked with me. Uh, I knew that Romania was not gonna turn its back on me because I was gay, not when I was wrapped in the American flag. Uh, and, and also I felt a sense of umbrage almost, uh, that of all the ambassadors in the world, I would be the one to be asked, leave your partner behind because of someone's bias. I mean, what are these principles of fairness and freedom and equality that we're taught uh, as children to represent abroad? Uh, and maybe because I had been later in life in coming out uh, as gay, I felt it was something too precious to lose. So for all of those reasons, I sort of stumbled into becoming the first out gay Senate confirmed ambassador. Uh, I wasn't trying to be the first. I never really thought about it those in that way. Uh, I wasn't really trying to make a point either. But for me, the only solution and the only way I could proceed was by being out. It was not just the right thing to do. In other words, it really was the only thing to do. And my instincts were right up to a point. Uh, I was just damn naive in terms of thinking through the repercussions. Uh, I have a lot of stories I could tell that are better told over drinks than from a podium. Uh, <laughs> But the, here's the key thing. Most of those stories were not about Romania. They were about America. They were about our fixation on LGBT issues at that particular time. The fixation has changed somewhat, but it still is there. Um, I got bags and bags of hate mail. I had conservative uh, groups calling for my resignation, uh, religious groups as well. I had uh, conservative staffers, Republican staffers all coming to Romania telling politicians, ignore this guy, he's gonna be recalled, doing everything they could to undercut my authority. I had a senior member of my military team at the embassy look me in the eye and sort of sneer that he reported to God and not to me. Um, good luck with that. Uh, <laughs> it has taken me a long time to unpack all of this, to be honest, but I wanna give you five brief lessons that I learned about being a, a representative of America as an out gay man. First, you cannot run from the hate. I know that my experiences were unique to a particular place and time, but ask anyone in public service who is out LGBT and they'll tell you the same thing. They have their stories to tell as well. The groups and some of the individuals and the mindsets that really fought against us from Stonewall on in this long continuum are still out there and they still push, but you cannot let them define you uh, and you can rise above their messaging. Second, authenticity really does matter. It's like a throwaway line you hear all the time about how important it is to be authentic, but it's really true. Um, I never could have been pushing the Romanian government to be open and transparent in its dealings with Romanian citizens if it had become known, and it would have become known at some point, uh, that I was trying to shield this part of my life from public view. And I had a rocky, rocky start with the Romanian people a uh, very sensationalist press there. But once I got beyond that, Romanians came to really like me. When I left the country, I was one of the most popular people in the country because I was talking about issues that mattered to the Romanians and because they also saw me as more open and outright than any of their political leaders of the time. I think it's important that we not forget that the progress that's been made on LGBT rights has not been made inside Stonewall, it's made outside Stonewall. It's made in the streets in part, but it's also been made by confronting stereotypes and by showing people that we care about family and community and country and the world like everyone else, and by showing that we can, in fact, do the job. So a third lesson, uh, never lose sight of the people behind you. 
And when I say people behind you, I don't mean necessarily supporters, although there is that too. There were seven out gay staffers at the embassy in Bucharest when I arrived as ambassador. They didn't come because of me, but I can confidently say that at least a couple of them probably are on that career track to become ambassadors at some point, hopefully soon. Uh, I've had foreign service officers tell me that they decided to join the career and, and to pursue a career in diplomacy when they read my story and they saw that an out gay man could actually become ambassador. Uh, I've had closeted officials in Romania tell me what it meant in their country and for them personally to have such an open and direct representation of, of how you don't have to be fixated on this issue. And I've had diplomats from other countries tell me the impact in their countries as well. So I think it's important to remember who, you in, who, who inspired you. For me, it was Barney Frank, God love him, uh, like he was for many people and try to be that inspiration to others, the people that are behind you. Fourth lesson that I've learned is that Stonewall really has not uh, tarnished our country's image abroad at all. It's burnished it. By the time I left Romania, I had countless Romanians that came and told me that because I had been out gay, they had to come and reflect on the fact that a great country like ours would send someone to represent it who was from a minority that Romanians despise so much. It made them rethink their biases. And it also was important for the embassy because Stonewall has given us a sort of a judgment-free zone from which we can comment on issues uh, related to another country's uh, public dealings. Uh, it's very, very hard sometimes to, uh, you know, to, to talk about issues without the government saying, you're interfering in our personal affairs. But if you can say, Look, here's how, we, here's how we've dealt with this issue at home. Here's what discrimination means in terms of privacy. Here's what it means in terms of community health. Uh, here are the issues related to the fair protections that law should afford. If you deal, in, deal with it in that fashion, it's very hard for a government to dismiss you. And whatever foreigners know or think they know about LGBT people or LGBT rights, they know they want freedom and they know they want opportunity. Uh, and so we and Stonewall become a good example. And finally, one more th point. Uh, we're not at the end of Stonewall's journey. Now, we have been so incredibly privileged to see in our lifetime so much progress in LGBT acceptance in this country. Who could have imagined 50 years ago Lori Lightfoot winning Chicago? Who could have imagined Pete Buttigieg you know, running openly as a gay man for president and being so nonchalant about it and so straightforward about it. No dissembling, no, no trying to hide anything. Uh, it's just amazing. I don't think that would have happened five years ago. So the media can fit all this into sort of a narrative that Americans tend to love, you know, one of those uh, geometric kinds of things, a straight line, low to high, or an arc that bends toward justice, or little boxes that you put all these incongruities of American life into. And we know that Hollywood really loves the happy ending. But the fact is, there's been so much that we can celebrate. And while we do celebrate that tonight, tomorrow we have to go back to work. It's important that we do this job of mentoring, that we do what we can to support with time and money candidates, gay or straight, who support notions of equality and want to protect Stonewall's legacy. And we need to do our part too, even if we're not in the political trail ourselves. We need to do what we can to try to protect the legacy and ensure that our country's promise of equality uh, is uh, carried out in all aspects of life, from housing to employment to justice. So many of you probably are in this fight, and to those of you who are, I say thank you. Uh, to those of you who aren't, I say join us. And to the panel, I say you're up. <laughs> yes. So thanks. I'm going to sit here on the end. Hi, Hello. I'm for, former city of Houston mayor and niece Parker and current CEO and president of the LGBTQ Victory Fund and Victory Institute. It's going to be my honor to lead this panel presentation of uh, an old hand and two rising stars. 
for the LGBT community in uh, their respective state legislatures. So first, really not old, but I just had to get that in, Brian Sims, who has represented the, the people of the 182nd District in the Pennsylvania House since 2011, and was the first openly gay elected state legislator in Pennsylvania history. Uh, prior to his time in office, he served as staff counsel at the Philadelphia Bar Association, practiced law as a disability attorney, and uh, worked as the senior law clerk at the US, in U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Washington office. Uh, glad to have you here and looking forward to the conversation. You can, I'm sure, visit his Wikipedia page and find out more. Uh, <laughs> Next, uh, we have Brianna Titone, Colorado House of Representatives. Uh, Representative Titone uh, was just elected, took a, uh, wiped out an incumbent uh, in the uh, uh, general election. <laughs> Serves the people of District 27 in the Colorado House. Uh, as a uh, newcomer to, uh, to the political process, she, uh, is distinguishing herself for, I believe, her willingness to engage with her constituents, but also understanding that as the first transgender person to serve in the Colorado legislature and one of only four trans state legislature, legislators in America, that she represents a much broader constituency than just those who have the opportunity to vote for her. She's a geologist by trade and has worked as an environmental consultant, mining consultant, and as a web application developer, and just completed uh, a master's degree as well. In August. In, August. Uh, in the midst of the campaign. Don't try this at home. <laughs> and then finally, uh, Delegate Gabriel uh, Acevedo of the Maryland House of Delegates, also uh, a newcomer, representing the people of District 39. Uh, in his professional life, he is a field representative and organizer for the Municipal and County Government Employees Organization and has a background in policy and business development. Uh, it's great to have all three of you here and uh, look forward to having a little bit of a conversation. Hello. There we go. Uh, the difference in perspective over time. But uh, first, let me say that we're about to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, which is considered the dividing line, not the start of the LGBT rights movement, but really the dividing line from a style of organizing that took place before that to a much more aggressive and in-your-face uh, type of organizing. And as the only one sitting up here who's actually old enough to remember it, I'd like a little bit of your perspective on what it means to be in this 50 years post Stonewall generation and what, has, what do you think has changed for you individually and politically? And I'm gonna start with Brian. Um, hello everybody. Um, given that this is Stonewall we're talking about and that I'm up here with a person of color and a trans person, I think I'm gonna start with them if it's all the same. I don't, I don't mean to defer, but I, listen, every one of us knows the cis washing, the white washing that has happened with Stonewall throughout yeah, yeah. our history. Hey, so, yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's, that's, that's excellent. You each have a microphone. I was picking on you because you're the <coughs> oldest on the panel. But Go ahead, Brianna. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, you, you can actually speak. Stonewall changed things in terms of, of activism, the style of activism, how we uh, advocated our, for ourselves publicly. And I was wondering if you had a perspective on that. Uh, and I will just tell you, and for the benefit of the audience, prior to Stonewall, it was, let's put on our business suits and show up and, and show that we were just like everybody else. And after Stonewall, it, it wasn't immediate, but very quickly devolved to, we're here, queer, we're queer, get used to it. And uh, I guess where you fall on that, on that spectrum and, and what do you see as the impact of that on how you approached politics and organizing? Well, uh, thank you for having me here. And, and um, I actually just went to the, uh, the museum down uh, on Pennsylvania, and they have a great display down there showing a lot of the, uh, 
the Stonewall events and prior to that and a lot of the things that happened in the news and how the news wasn't exactly very friendly to the movement and really displayed that pretty badly. Um, but, you know, Stonewall was a breaking point where people were just tired of, of getting beat up all the time and, and roused from, from places where they're just trying to have a good time. And that was, that was a real turning point for, for everyone. And, and it really got people to see that people weren't just like everybody else. And, and now we're seeing that happen even more and more uh, today. I mean, as you said, there are four of us as uh, transgender legislators in the state houses. And, you know, there are, the students are feeling a lot more uh, comfortable coming out in their schools. And more and more people that didn't think that they knew anybody, they're now knowing more people that are close to them that are out, that are LGBT, that are non-binary, that are trans. And because of that, people are really being forced to accept it and understand that it is uh, just a part of life. A lot of people that I've talked to uh, over the years have really said that uh, you know they didn't really agree with it very much until their child came out or you know someone close to them. And, and that really was something that helps with that movement. And people are becoming more and more comfortable as they see people running for office. I mean, you, you were a, a big part of that as well uh, in, a, in such a large city. And when people see people leading and stepping up and being themselves, and for me, my voice is, definitely does not match my appearance, but that was part of my authenticity that I wasn't going to change that. And when I talk to uh, students and, and other groups uh, that, I, that I get invited to speak with, I don't try to be anybody else but myself, and they really understand that. And that's what they're really craving right now because the momentum of being yourself and being accepted for who you are is just happening around us everywhere we look. And United Airlines just started out having a, a gender neutral thing on their tickets. I mean, they're just little things like this that really just kind of incrementally get us to a place where people are just more accepted overall. Elegant, how about you? Yeah, well, <clears throat> uh, first, uh, thank you to NYU um, and for everyone being here on the 50th anniversary of Stonewall. Um, you know, really appreciate uh, being in conversation with, um, you know, two of my contemporaries and uh, uh, Mayor Parker. Um, and I think it's an opportunity for us to look back and to reflect um, but also to, so, so I subscribe to the Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera School of Organizing, right? And that is uh, the most vulnerable and the most marginalized amongst us. Uh, we must ensure that we're centering their voices and their concerns, right? And that was a reason why they created uh, STAR, uh, Street uh, Transvestite uh, Action Revolutionaries, right? Um, so, because at that time, we were seeing a community that uh, largely was marginalizing our own, uh, that we wanted to push this narrative that this is what uh, 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 gay rights look like, this is what our movement looks like, and it was so much more diverse than that. Um, and I think it's, it's it, one, it, it, it teaches us uh, the work that we need to do today in centering the voices of those most marginalized amongst us, that is our youth, uh, our seniors, uh, and our trans and gender non-conforming siblings. Uh, but it also shows us uh, that it is our responsibility to not just dismantle uh, the systems that oppress us, but also understanding how uh, this system uh, has uh, various agencies uh, that engage in state-sanctioned violence, right? So the Stonewall riots began because of police violence, um, and understanding that it was one to think that we were other, we were less than, we were not deserving uh, of living in this community that we ourselves have contributed to, to, to making so rich, but we are going to use the arm of the state and we're gonna engage in state-sanctioned violence. Uh, and I think it's important to point that out because police violence is also an issue that we should be advocating for today. 
Um, but what we need to understand is that, one, we have to organize those most marginalized amongst us, and we have to honor the movement. And so the question that we should be asking ourselves as a community today, are we doing what our elders, people whose shoulders we're standing on, were fighting for uh, 50 years ago? And if the answer is no, then we need to reflect on what that is uh, and come back to uh, what was the work that our elders, Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, Miss Major, so many others were engaged in, and that's the work that we have to be doing. That's the kind of intentional organizing that we have to be doing. Um, and so that's how I see the work that we still need to do. That's how I see the kind of organizing that we need to do. Uh, and, and, and that's where I see you know, the voices that we should be centering as far as our community. Mother's a retired lieutenant colonel in the army. Actually, both of my parents are lieutenant colonels. It means that I'm, I'm 40 and my mom could beat the hell out of me. And <laughs> y y she used to say something to me that was that if you, if you hear something amazing, don't repeat it, just acknowledge it. And so I, I, I want to acknowledge what both of you have said. And I, the, the lessons of this are, are, are difficult, right? It's part of the reason that we have to revisit this so often and, and make sure that we're also acknowledging the 51st year and the 52nd year. And it's so that we don't forget the, the really valuable lessons. I, I have the honor of representing one of those cities that was very, very early in LGBT protests and the Medellin Society and everyone dressing, you know, dressing like they were going to Sunday church in order to show some level of both conformity but also to stand out. Um, for me, I, you know, I, I reflect on Stonewall quite a bit for somebody who, who wasn't there for it. I, um, and, and there are a lot of lessons of it that I think are very contemporary. Um, that there are strength in numbers. I think one of the one of the very valuable lessons of, of Stonewall is that there is strength in numbers. You know, people showed from everywhere in those nights to stand together, to to show solidarity, to be stentorian, and that was new for so many people that were there. Um, I think that was new for a lot of our allies to see us so angry, see us so rallied together. Um, visibility matters. That's a, that's something that we have learned has advanced the LGBT political cause for as long as it has existed. Visibility matters. The single most impactful, statistically, the most impactful thing most of us have ever done on LGBT rights was to come out to our network of straight people. Um, and that's a very real thing. And so uh, th those are lessons to me that are very valuable. They're very contemporary. I um, mean, the last one is one that I, I for me, I think is, is very important, but I, for others it's, it's controversial, and that is that when you are pushed, push back. Um, I, am, I, am, I am not somebody that believes in violence. I am not somebody that believes in, in um, overt aggression. I, as the son of ar army colonels, I think I could even say I'm a pacifist. Mm -hmm. But I also do not get bullied. I don't expect anyone to take getting bullied to be a martyr to prove a point to anyone else. When we are pushed, we should push back. And when we push back, we, we gain our rights. Nobody, as they say, nobody gives us a seat at the table. We take it. Uh, actually, I just was reminded I uh, have to offer apologies for Angie Craig, who was supposed to be actually sitting in this seat. Uh, our member of Congress from uh, uh, Minnesota, who is actually on the House floor, got called back. It's nice to be in the majority for a change. <laughs> it means that, that uh, she had to do, do some work tonight. Okay, you said something, and as did uh, Brianna, that I think is very important, and that is the, the issue of visibility. I would submit that one of the reasons that uh, the debate has changed for lesbian and gay uh, uh, men and women, and not changed enough for the trans community, and still even less for those who are at the intersection, as, as men and women of color, is that no one in America can say they don't know anybody who is gay or lesbian, even if it's Ellen on TV. They know somebody, they, oh yeah, somebody gay. Uh, but there's still lots and lots of folks who don't have an experience of someone who is trans. And I know as a movement, we, many of us, have been working hard to push uh, spokespersons to the front who can represent the trans community, but also to push forward those who are, as you said earlier, not cisgender white men, to show that uh, the intersectionality. And I wish that the, the two of you, if you 
sir, would, would begin to talk a little bit about what it means to be in that, to be a first, to be in that position, and uh, how many hats can you wear, and how do you, how do you bring those different identities forward? Yeah, um, I, I, it's, it's, it's not lost on me the historic nature, not just uh, of my run, but my election. Like, that is certainly not lost on me. Uh, and I don't doubt that me being where I am uh, inspires, uh, because I've already heard stories uh, from a number of uh, queer youths who have come up to me um, and uh, just shared how good it is to see someone that looks like them in a position of decision making or in power. Um, so I do not uh, in any way uh, dim diminish the historic nature of uh, my win, uh, but I'm more focused on ensuring that, uh, that I am not the last. Uh, and there are certainly more folks like me uh, because one, it enriches uh, the conversation and the debate around uh, the issues that impact our communities. And I'm so glad that you, 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 you mentioned intersectionality because I think the word is thrown around a little too much. Um, and some of us think we have an understanding of what intersectionality means. Um, and I would suggest that we go back to the person who coined the term, Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, and how she described it was understanding that those who exist uh, at the intersection of various identities experience oppression differently, right? We live, uh, as, was pointing out, uh, as was pointed out by Brian, in a cis, hetero, patriarchal, capitalist, um, uh, uh, sexist, uh, racist, classist society uh, and understanding how each of those isms uh, impact members of our community differently. Uh, and I think there's strength in that. We really ha we have one of the most uh, diverse communities in the world. I mean, where, where else do you find people from various backgrounds, various abilities, uh, gender expression, sexuality, et cetera? And I think therein lies our strength. But understanding that it's important for us to lift up the voices uh, that, aren't, that aren't, aren't always intentionally included in those conversations, so trans and gender non-conforming folks, LGBTQ people of color, uh, and I'm hoping we could delve into that a little bit more as we uh, get into the panel about just some of the issues and the work that we still need to do uh, today, but understanding that uh, their people experience oppression differently. Um, and so understanding that and organizing around that only makes our community stronger, right? Uh, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera had to start STAR because in the spaces that you thought they would have been welcomed, they weren't. There were people who weren't interested in their stories, their narratives, what it is that they were fighting for, and that's why they were there alone, right? And so it's critical for us to understand that those most vulnerable amongst us are the ones who we should be focusing most on. Uh, and it in no way takes away from the work that we uh, can and should be doing, but it just means that we're being intentional about those vulnerable in our community. Um, and so that's, the, that's, that's how I see it. That's, that's, that's how I see um, you know, my role in the Maryland General Assembly. Uh, it's not just to fight for queer liberation, but understanding too, as someone who's Afro-Latinx immigrant formerly working for that, these issues impact people who identify like me differently. And so it's important for me when I step into rooms not to check any of my identities at the door because that is what changes and enriches the conversation. I can speak, yes, it is one thing for me to talk about queer liberation, but there are queer immigrant folks right now, including trans women who are in ICE detention centers, right? And so it is not enough for us to fight for queer liberation. We also have to fight for queer immigrants as well who are experiencing the brunt of a racist and a transphobic and anti-LGBTQ uh, 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 agency and system mm -hmm. that denies our humanity. And so I'm hoping that you know, uh, we understand that sooner rather than later and fight for those, I can't say it enough, most vulnerable amongst us. Brianna Howe, or I should say, Representative Titan, because you worked hard for that title and you should be, uh, Excuse me for not using it. Please. Yeah, uh, as, a, as a trans person, um, I, I feel it's, it's my goal 
and my duty to um, be the person who is visible and and lifts up the community and really look forward to uh, the next inspiring the next generation of people that come after me and that's I mean that for me it was Danica Rome that really got me to run and you know having her win gave me the thumbs up that it was possible to win because I didn't think as qualified as I am for this job I didn't think anyone was going to take me seriously and when I ran not many people took me seriously and part of that was because I was uh, somewhat of an unknown person in politics I I was a geologist and a software developer and was not really out as being trans all that long before I, I got into this space. So for me, it was I had a very tall learning curve to figure this all out. And, and it really, when I finally came out and was myself, I realized that I was in this group of people that was being discriminated against. And you know I had a lot of privilege before that. And, and it was kind of an eye-opening thing. And the kind of person that I am, I needed to go do something to help people. And that was my goal my whole life. I've always gone out of my way to find opportunities to help people. And, and running for office seemed to be the best way to do it. Because just me being out as trans, people were inspired by what I was doing being myself. And for that reason alone, it was enough to say that, you know, if I just run for office, I can do a lot of good to help people and to be visible. And, and that's why I wear my trans vans. <laughs> and, I mean, people don't even pay any attention to it. They don't even see it. But I'm visible, you know, even when I'm not opening my mouth and, and outing myself, because that's really how I, how I out okay. myself is when I talk. Um, but it's... Um, it, it's so important to to just really get more people involved, and that's that's my goal is, is to pay it forward uh, from from Danica helping me, and I want to help other people, and we need to get more people involved and and get more representation out there because we've been around a long time. We've been here since before Marsha P. Johnson, and. Now people actually have the courage to be themselves, and um, we're very valuable parts of the community, and, and that's where I find my role is to show all those people that didn't believe in me uh, that you know you should believe in me and everyone else. That so, are, so you embrace the role of, of role model as yes. part of your job? Yes, absolutely. Representative Sims, uh, how do you lift up marginalized communities and make sure that those voices are heard? Uh, the answer has actually changed dramatically in my time in this job. Um, I, when I first got this job, I, it, what came with it was an attendant um, amount of attention that I was not used to at all. Um, and that attention grew way beyond the scope of just, you know, a, a, I'm one of 203 legislators in um, one of 50 states. And it, the attention was larger than that. And so I, for a while, had the misconception that if I was talking about it, that's why I was bringing things attention. And I thought that my way of being an ally was to talk about the people around me that I felt like needed more attention and that, that deserved more attention. And I've, I've, I have frankly learned o over time that it's still a thing that, that, it's still a thing that white men do a lot of. We center ourselves in everything. And I, so I had this idea that like, if, I, if I'm talking about you, the, this is about you, but if, of course it's about me talking about you. Um, <laughs> And so what I've tried to do with my, my allydom of late is be reminded of a couple of things. One, don't be so presumptuous as to think you're going to give a voice to the voiceless. Give them a microphone, right? Um, uh, I have, there's a, a guy named Adrian Rivera-Reyes who is running for office in Philadelphia. And he, he, says that, he, he has said that to me recently. Um, I, there's also this thing about allies. I teach straight people how to be allies all the time. And I often say to them, you don't get to stand in front of us unless we ask you to. Stand next to me and inform me. Stand behind me and push me. But the only time you can stand in front of me as an ally is when I need you to take some shots so that I'm not taking them. <laughs> and yet, as a white guy, I recognize that, uh, that my, my allydom with people of color, my allydom as a feminist, um, often gets in the way of the work of feminism and of advancing the rights of people of color. And so the way that I think my allydom has changed is that I, I try so much harder now to 
amplify voices rather than just to just talk about those voices. I try to lend my platform rather than to stand on my platform together. Um, the best example I can give is it was recently Transgender Day of Visibility, which for me has always been a big, a big part of being an ally and trying to teach people that are gonna pay attention to what I'm doing just because they happen to like my beard or because I'm a big cis gay white guy that, that there are other issues outside of just our community. And so I, I've always been, been very proud of the work that I do around Transgender Day of Visibility. But this year, I turned my page over. We called it a takeover. I, I, I handed two, can two trans candidates, one of whom is one of my best friends in this world, um, a social media that had 300,000 people that would follow them. And it was about them and the messages they wanted to share and the way they wanted to share them. And they got to reach out to the people they wanted to. And so, in, in part, to answer your question, I, listen, I, I believe that after seven years in office, I actually do understand why um, wh why difference is so important in legislatures. Um, there's a lot of data that tells us that marginalization breeds empathy. Um, it's not to say, oh, because you've been beat down, you're gonna be better at understanding other people, but no, if you have operated within systems that are not designed for you and you have still found any modicum of success, you've done it because you are good at spotting problems, at overcoming problems. You can spot problems in other people and you can help other people overcome them. There is a massive amount of learning that happens through marginalization that a lot of us want to dismiss. And so it's not just, yes, this person would be better because they're a woman, or yes, this person would be better because they were trans. It's yes, this person would be better because the life experiences that they have had to live through in this patriarchal world, in this sexist world, in this anti-immigrant world, have taught them lessons that are really valuable in representative democracy. I don't want an entire legislature that looks like me and my dad. I want an entire legislature that's gonna be responsive to a, a very diverse world. And so it, it's not just that it's appropriate in representative democracy to have all people represented. The, there's there, the data, the math, the science tells us to put people in these jobs that are the best at being representatives in a representative democracy. And I think what makes people the best is having a finely honed sense of empathy. And unfortunately, a lot of empathy and a lot of understanding is born of hardship. And my guess is everybody in this room can think of learning, the learning episodes in their life that were born of really hard times. People who have always had financial privilege can think of that, that time that they were really broke. And people who've always been able to walk into a room and get whatever they want can think about that time they couldn't. Well, imagine if that was your every day, your every life, how many learning environments you would go through and how learned you would be. Those are the people that I want making decisions about my life and about my government, for sure. You've, in some ways, ca encapsulated what we do at Victory, which is that we don't, we're, we're not a policy organization. We don't have uh, a litmus test other than we are a pro-choice organization, and you have to be fully inclusive of the entire spectrum of the LGBTQ community. Uh, but that we believe if we put the right people in the right place, they'll do the right things. But Sometimes I need a little bit of, of a nudge. So, uh, Representative Acevedo, uh, where, what have you been working on to help provide that nudge? What are your uh, main initiatives and uh, how has it been? Yeah, so I, I, I don't, I, I, I see my role in the Maryland General Assembly as a continuation of the work that I did as an activist and an organizer. Um, uh, I was fortunate enough to, um, to have advocated for marriage equality, and then when it went to referendum, Maryland was the first state to approve marriage equality at the ballot box. Uh, and our opponents were able to get enough signatures to put it on the ballot uh, by misrepresenting or attempting to misrepresent and, and, and uh, paint our community as uh, undeserving of rights. Um, and then being engaged uh, in the transgender equality fight in Maryland, because that came afterwards, because one of the things that I noticed, uh, and this comes back to our conversation about allyship, is that the moment we got marriage equality in Maryland, a lot of my cis, gay uh, brothers uh, thought that that was it, right? We got marriage equality, we're good. And it took a few of us, myself included, to remind folks that one, we still have trans folks who uh, are treated as less than in our state. That's a problem. Two, 40% of our youth still are homeless. Three, LGBTQ seniors are still mistreated in long-term care. Four, uh, uh, um, 
trans women, their life expectancy, particularly trans women of color, are 30, right? And when we think about these numbers, uh, it really begs a question, do we care about our community as a whole? Do we want to engage in that kind of a radical love that is necessary, that was present back then during Stonewall, that should be present today? Um, are we engaging in that work? And so I see my role in the state legislature as a continuation of all of that, uh, right? The, the, what, what I'm working on right now from uh, things uh, such as access to prep for our youth and sexual health to um, uh, understanding that we need to strengthen this uh, conversion uh, uh, ban and conversion therapy that our legislature passed uh, a couple of years ago. Um, but in essence, what we did was we banned it, but we were saying anyone that engaged in it would get a slap on the wrist. So in other words, if you are a um, medical provider and you engage in conversion therapy, uh, you could potentially lose your license, right? So well, what about all the other folks who aren't medical providers who are engaging in this, right? How are we protecting our youth and how are we making it clear that this is not okay? Uh, and so we still have a lot of work to do uh, and I see my role in the state legislature as continuing that work but also educating people uh, because a big part of legislating is also educating our colleagues and even educating folks within our own community, uh, understanding that uh, uh, because there are a lot of LGBTQ folks who don't understand how we are disproportionately impacted as LGBTQ people of color, right? There are still a lot of people who don't understand the issues that our trans and gender non-conforming siblings face. And so there's the education part of it, but there's also the legislating part of it. But one thing that should always be constant and has been constant in my mind is that we need to advocate and we need to do that from a place of radical love and we need to do that uh, 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 before uh, we legislate because then it makes it even more difficult for us to explain to our colleagues, even our allies, you know, why this is important to our community. And so the education has to take place uh, in collaboration with the legislating. And so that's where I see my role. I, I've, I've never given up. I've never abdicated the, the work that I was doing. Uh, I, it's, it's just a continuation of it. And I think that's how we should, uh, we, we should all see this. But to, uh, to, I want to come back to your point, Mayor. You mentioned that um, we want to ensure that we're getting people uh, elected into office and, 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 and we know that they'll do the right thing. Now, I would love to see more LGBTQ people at every single level of government, right? Um, I'd love to see a government that looks like me. But I also realize that there are LGBTQ folks who are not committed to our collective liberation. Right? And it's, it's not just about saying, well, we need to get more LGBTQ people elected. It's about we need to ensure that we're electing LGBTQ people who are committed to our collective liberation. Because there are some people who uh, gain positions of power and work to undermine our community. Even when they're from our communities ourselves, right? Whether it's internalized transphobia, internalized homophobia or anti-blackness or what have you, right? These are the people that we need to ensure when you get in positions of power, it's about caring ab about the least of us and all of us as a whole. And, and I will say, absolutely. <laughs> and I will say that we have uh, declined a number of endorsements, unfortunately, over the last few years of folks who don't, uh, are not fully inclusive of the, the trans community. Anybody and heard from Aaron Shock lately? <laughs> But I would also say that uh, as it wasn't that long ago that the, a lot of the national organizations didn't consider uh, full trans inclusion important. So you know th this is this is evolving, and we're going to go to questions in in just a moment. But Representative Titone, as an acknowledged role model, but you are also a target, and trans issues are really the the tip of the of the spear right now. And uh, as Delegate Severo said, uh, the life expectancy for trans women of color is unfortunately uh, very short, and too many of them are uh, forced into sex work. Yeah. And that, that is, a, is a very dangerous place to be. How can you affect that at, in the position you are? You're, you're representing Colorado, but you also represent a huge constituency of your brothers and sisters. 
Yeah, and, and uh, in, in Colorado, we do have quite a, a good situation there. We have a lot of laws in place to protect people, trans people. Uh, we just passed the conversion therapy ban with some teeth in it, so make sure people do lose their license. We passed a bill to make it easier for trans people to get their driver's license, uh, their birth certificate changed. Um, but, you know, we still have the underlying issue uh, of trans people, not only in Colorado, but outside of Colorado and all of their struggles. And uh, for me, uh, in a district that I walk a tightrope on, uh, when it comes to legislation, I stick to what the constituents ask me to do. There's not a lot of constituents asking me to tackle those issues legislatively, but that doesn't stop me from being the voice behind a lot of the initiatives, like the conversion therapy bill and the other bill. And I do stand in the front, you know, at in the press conference, I'm right there. Uh, if I'm not speaking, I'm standing right behind the, the sponsor of the bill. Um, but I'm working on a couple things uh, with some legislators on the issues of, of uh, trans women in prison. And a lot of people have talked to me specifically about uh, mistreatment. There's been people that sent me messages online saying, I've seen it firsthand, and I know that they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And uh, I'm just starting out and navigating what I can and I can't do and trying to figure this all out and working with people. And hopefully uh, in the next session, I'll be able to work on getting those problems solved and you know dropping in on the prison and asking for a tour at the last minute so that way they can't change the way they're doing things um, that's what i plan to do i don't want to set up a meeting a week in, in advance and then have them change the way that they're working on things i want to find out what is it like right now i'm coming over right now get me in there i want to see it and, and that's really the only way to um, really tackle those problems, coming from me, seeing those problems, you know, they're going to be honest with me about that. And there's, there's a lot of things that I'm going to be trying to, to advocate for um, that I should be because I am that person that, that is advocating for those people that are most distressed right now. So all of you, uh, your elections were historic first, and I think, and I'm, confident that all of you understand that just standing up and running and being uh, your authentic selves I in as many places as possible makes a difference, but you have both a legislative responsibility then and uh, an advocacy role. And, and while I ask how we're going to do the audience questions, is it just me? me the Where are they? Thank you. <laughs> Start lining up if you want to ask questions. Uh, what else would you like to tell the audience about those those dual roles of legislator and, and advocate? The first thing I want to tell you all is that you can do these jobs too, and please do. It's not brain surgery. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. There's something extremely self-serving in how elected officials spoke about their jobs for all time. We talked about them like they were the pinnacle of these mountains that only we could climb to, and that's stupid. Um, my job, my life gets better when more people that are in the communities that I'm in, in the neighborhoods that I'm in, doing the work that I'm doing are in these jobs. And so rather than talk about them in these ivory tower, unattainable ways, I think one of the things that we can do, and that I, I hope I'm doing for all of you, is to let you know that these jobs are meant for all of us. My legislature has 203 members in the state house, and 140 of them are former small business owners. It, the number one qualification to be a, a, a rep in Pennsylvania is to fail a business, apparently. And you can all fail a business, right? <laughs> um, if they were good at those jobs, they'd be medium-sized business owners. Instead. <laughs> What I have is I have a legislature that has one urban planner, one civil rights attorney, that's me. Um, we have maybe four or five ex-school teachers, maybe one or two principals. And you know, I talk to people all the time and they go, oh, you know, not me, I'm an architect. You know how many architects are in my state legislature? None. And I promise you we're doing things that impact those. And again, it's a representative democracy. It's not a, a representative democracy of lawyers. It's not a representative democracy of people who are interested in politics. It's a representative democracy. The thing that I think all of us can do is to make sure that all of us do these jobs. Please, 
please consider doing these. I, I, the worst thing I think can happen when you see a group of elected officials talking about this is when you walk away and go, man, they were really good on that. I could never do that. I promise you, all of you have some topic that you know better than the three of us up here know for sure. And if we were reversed and you were talking about the thing that you're an expert in, you'd be the expert that would blow our minds. Be that expert in a legislature and it will make all of our lives better. You're here, excellent. Here. If, if, before we go to the audience, either of you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, and I, I'm a scientist. I have degrees. I have more degrees than a thermometer. Some people say, <laughs> and um, and people really responded well to that when I was campaigning because they're like, yes, we need scientists that understand things to be in the legislature, and and yes, I do. I understand a lot of these issues. I actually studied these issues. I'm not, you know, just an attorney who just knows the law. I mean, we've got enough attorneys in the state house. I mean, you know, we've got a whole department of attorneys that actually do all of our bills. I don't know how to write a bill like they know how to write it. I just come up with the ideas and, and work with people to come up with the ideas. And I mean, just being a regular person, I try to be a, as authentic and regular person as I can be because I want people to just think that they can do it. I don't want to be just one of four trans legislators. I want to be one of 12 trans le legislators. And, I mean, and, and keep making that number bigger. I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm happy to share the stage with everyone. And, and that's why I'm really trying to get more people to come out and vote. And when I, uh, to run for office, not to, and, and to vote too, we want that too. Um, but you know, when I talk to, uh, I, I talk to a lot of students, I go to colleges, I talk to students, I talk to young people at the GSAs at, at the high schools and, and um, at, at even junior high schools. And I just tell them, uh, you know, this is what it's like to, to be a legislator and you know, if you wanna take that path when you're ready, you let me know and I will tell you how, what you have to do. And when it comes to figuring it all out, you know, victory is the place to to go to find out how it all works. And there's a, there's a magic formula that when you actually follow the formula, it, it works. I mean, just not every time, but don't it does say, Don't say magic formula, hard work formula. It, well, it is formula a hard work. formula is clear. Yes. <laughs> no, the magic is kind of in the hard work. But it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. I, I really have a good time as a legislator. Um, because I like being pushed a little bit to the limits of, of what I have to do every day. And um, because of that, I, I, I want to stay around and do this more. And uh, I never really imagined myself as a legislator. I pinch myself sometimes. It's like, oh, I'm a state legislator now. This is pretty cool. Um, and please, everyone, just do, if you have a do, if you think you want to do some good things for your community, this is the way to do it. Every level of government, please run for office. So really quickly, um, uh, I, as, as legislators, uh, our job is to legislate, but more importantly, our job, and I've, I've, I've said this, I've, I've said this to a lot of my colleagues because I've, I've, I've already had some folks in my party who have uh, come to me and say, you know, Gabe, you need to tone it down a little bit. You know, Gabe, don't say it that way. You know, Gabe, maybe you want to say it this way. Um, I'm going to say it how I say it, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, I'm responsible for what I say, right? Not how you receive it or how you interpret it. But uh, I do think it's important for us to do that because uh, the moment we become comfortable, we're really not making progress, right? The only institutions that are uh, incapable of progress is the cemetery, all right? And so it, it, it should always be our goal uh, to, especially in positions of power, to move the conversation, first and foremost. The, uh, the legislating will happen eventually, but your job, first and foremost, is to move the conversation. Uh, and in a lot of state capitals, the conversation around LGBTQ people is a very myopic one. It's a very ignorant one. Right, And so when you come in and you think, well, I'm going to introduce this bill, I'm going to introduce that bill around, um, you know, let's say LGBTQ youth homeless in, homelessness. In fact, uh, the Maryland General Assembly passed the Ending Youth Homelessness Act just last year, right? But for years, a lot of folks in our caucus were having conversations about LGBTQ youth homelessness. And at any time, we could have introduced legislation. That's when I was, you know, a lobbyist and an activist on the other side. But that educating and that advocacy had to come before the legislation. 
And so I think it's important for all of us to understand that regardless of what position you're in, uh, whatever elected office, your first job is to move the conversation because nothing happens if the conversation isn't different. And your first job is definitely not re-election. And unfortunately, that's uh, what a lot of our legislators think. I'm going to start on this side, sir. Thank you. Um, I'm concerned about religious freedom legislation, and it's rearing its ugly head in Texas, the last example, several southern states, certainly red states. Can you address that and how we might combat it? Because I honestly think that's the next civil rights fight for us. Uh, well, RIFRA bills, but are they coming up in your legislature? Yeah. Yes. If they are, please. Yeah. Well, it's, it's not going to go anywhere. Okay. One, um, two, but yes, we have seen some of those. Uh, I, I, I would say, um, I would agree with uh, with um, uh, Mayor uh, Buttigieg, uh, where um, you know I was listening to him recently, and he said that we need to see an emergence of the religious left, mm. uh, and I think that's critical because. Uh, what we're seeing, the people who are dominating the conversation, particularly on religion and uh, 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 puritanical, whatever it is, right? Th that space is occupied mostly uh, by folks on the right. Uh, and I think we need to, coming back to what I said earlier about radical love, uh, I think it's important for us to have folks within our own community, those who uh, are uh, uh, in the faith community that are LGBTQ, to be standing up and pointing out that one, yes, I'm queer, but two, I am a person of faith, and here's what my faith teaches me. And while this person uh, is interpreting uh, this religious text this way, here's how I see it. Here's how I know it to be. Uh, and the reality of it is that is the kind of uh, response that we need to give. We have to, one, organize a as a community, and two, we have to see, we have to build uh, this religious left where we're showing people that there is a more just uh, 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 you know, a, a more just way to look at these issues through a faith lens. Um, and I think that's, that's important for us. But we're, we're seeing it in Maryland. It's not going to move anywhere. We're, we're a heavily democratic state, but I can't speak to other states like, you know, Brian, you're in the minority, and, and, and Brianna, I don't know what's going on in Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we don't have a uh, refer being proposed right now in part because I don't have any rights. Um, Pennsylvania is not a state that has non-discrimination. We have not added sexual orientation, gender identity, both real or perceived, into our Human Relations Act. Um, it comes up from time to time that, that we are the state that has the most municipal non-discrimination clauses, but that's a, a red herring. Every other state, by the time they got this many municipalities, passed a statewide law. Um, I, you know, I tell people often that I'm sort of a lazy agnostic. Um, if I cared more, I'd be an atheist. Um, I, 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 I am blessed to live in a country that says I won't be treated any differently under the laws, um, regardless of that or a whole bunch of other issues. And so, um, you know, I, I go to work every day as a, a proud atheist member that you know, swears in on the U.S. Constitution. But I do agree that we need to see the rise of, a, of a, at least a radical religious left. Um, I have friends all the time that say to me, oh, they're just hijacking what we're hearing from Christianity. But somehow that message doesn't seem to w resonate with them about the Islamic faith or, or, or you know, like so many other people in this world, frankly. And so I'm, I, I don't know, I really struggle in that I don't believe that houses of government should ever coincide with houses of worship. Um, I, I start every single day with a prayer. You probably saw that awful prayer that happened in my state legislature recently. Um, with Jesus Becky, we call her, where she said, you know, Jesus 13 times in 53 seconds, like it was a job interview, or he has a short attention span. <laughs> Um, but I, I think all of that is super problematic. But as, so long as it's going to exist, and, and you know, the data right now about how, how, how much Americans actually believe in the dogma of their own faith, I think is specious at best. But as long as we're going to pretend that re religion has to play a meaningful role in every elected official's life or in government, I want, I want liberal, um, liberal you know, believers to, to be vocal and to be loud. You guys are, you're sort of the antidote right now to so much of the negativity and we, we, we desperately need you in that conversation. And in Colorado, we, uh, we, we were the hate state in 1992. We've come a long way from that. Uh, we do hear those, uh, those religious freedom bills every single year. Uh, before I was a legislator, I was testifying against them. And now we just, you know, we just kill them. Every year, we just, they just keep coming up and we just keep killing them. And so I would say the best way to stop those from happening in other states is to get more 
D's elected uh, to, to have a majority so that way they can stop those things from coming through. And don't think that your district is not winnable because it may be. I mean, nobody thought I was going to win my district and I stood up and I just did it. If you're a good candidate and you run, you can oust an incumbent. And that is the best way to do it. And we have a few uh, religious uh, coalitions that are very liberal and they always come out and they testify on these bills and they say, look, we're religious people and we think this is wrong. And that is a powerful message uh, that, that comes across. The, the biggest danger is uh, the president packing the Supreme Court with those who support <laughs> RIFRA bills. But your question. Yeah, uh, thank you. I'll, I'll preface my question comment conflict with I'm a firm Victory Fund supporter, was at the brunch yesterday, had a great time. Uh, but, uh, and I guess there's always a but, um, Delegate uh, Acevedo made a great comment about putting those most vulnerable at the center. And I guess at the brunch I saw a lot of that on stage and in speeches, but I, in the audience was felt different to me. And I guess my question revolves around what the Victory Fund and large gay rights organizations, I think have fought this for a while, pride organizations, HRC, how to include uh, the disadvantaged youth and things like that in the organization so that everybody doesn't have to be rich to participate, I guess. And I, the feeling I left with was I'll save my small dollars and give them to like Casa Ruby, which is a, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. which I know that it's not a zero sum game and we can all, you know, money is important to winning elections and people with plenty of it can give all places. Um, but I guess what does the Victory Fund do to, you know, include those potential donors and people in the mission so that we give our time and our smaller dollars. So I'm gonna tell you, uh, frankly, a, a brunch like that is designed for big dollar donors. Mm -hmm. But we as an organization have a number of initiatives that, uh, that we engage in to, to bring more people into the process. We have what we call our Victory Empowerment Fellows, which uh, is where we identify uh, candidates of, of color, candidates who are uh, trans or women, non-traditional candidates who need extra assistance if they're gonna move into the political process. And we have a year-long mentorship uh, um, training program that includes our candidate and campaign training to help get them uh, to the finish line. We have an internship program on Capitol Hill. We have 12 interns, paid internship, because we don't want it to simply be for uh, those who can afford to, to come for a few months uh, to, to DC and, and, and work on the Hill. And uh, we work really hard to, uh, to make it an opportunity for kids who would not otherwise have that kind of exposure. And uh, take a look at our website and see uh, the, the diversity in that group, and I think you're gonna be really proud of it. I appreciate that you said that you, you saw uh, a multitude of voices on stage and it really reflects the diversity, but I would also say that, that politics is about who raises their hand and stands up. And who raises their hand and stands up is still very much white men. Uh, we work very hard, we work actually even harder to, to help advance uh, our non-traditional candidates, but some of that is a self-selection process. Uh, and uh, then finally, I will say that again, while a brunch is a, an opportunity for folks who can buy a pricey ticket to show up, uh, going to our website and deciding that you can give $5 or $10 a month to the candidates of your choice, we don't take a cut. You go to our, you go to our website, you see LGBT candidates across the United States who are running, that money goes straight into their campaigns and you can donate at any level. And uh, I remember the first person who wrote a $100 check to me, I, wrote a f I remember the first person who wrote a $1,000 check to me. Uh, and in fact, the first person who wrote a $100 and a $1,000 check was a, a trans woman. Uh, but I also remember somebody who sent me $3 every month because that was all she could afford from her social security. Anybody can contribute. And it's about, about whether that amount is significant to you. And I think everybody needs to contribute 
financially and time to the political process. It's not politics out there, it's our lives. Politics is just the method we choose to determine who's in the room making the decisions. They're making decisions for us, we have to be engaged in the process. And if, if I may add real quickly, um, and, and, and uh, thank you for the question, um, I'll also point out um, that the way we do that, the way we center uh, folks who are vulnerable and marginal in our communities is when we walk into spaces, instead of asking who's here, we should be asking who isn't. And that's the quickest way for us to say, okay, well, we know we do not have our trans and gender non-conforming siblings being represented here. We know we don't have LGBTQ people of color here. That type of intentionality changes the way we see things, changes the way we do things. I'll also share a story really quickly. Um, I used to be a huge, uh, and, and I still am, but uh, this was when I had some free time in college and whatnot, and everybody looking at me like, look at his baby face. What should you do? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but when um, I used to be a huge uh, Victory Fund volunteer, this was years ago uh, when um, Chuck was the president, and one of my good friends, uh, Travis Bally, who works for NARA, some of y'all may know him here, but we used to be super volunteers for Victory Fund, and I'll never forget we were having a virtual phone bank in Victory Fund's office in DC. Uh, and it was the first time I'd been to Victory Fund's office, and we were having a virtual phone bank for Wyatt Roy, who was a trans man running for city council in New York City. And I came in, and after the phone bank, uh, in Victory's office, there's this wall of the, all your endorsed candidates that won. And looking at the wall, it, it, majority of it was cis gay white men. And this was like years ago. I was in there recently, uh, and I'm glad and proud to, to, to say and to see that that has changed, right? So it means to say that at the top, leadership understands that it's important for our community to be inclusive and to show that level of diversity. There's a difference between diversity and inclusion. Diversity is about numbers, inclusion is about intentionality, right? So it's not enough for us to say, okay, we've got one or two trans folks elected, it's important for us to say, well, how can we get more trans folks elected? How can we get more LGBTQ folks elected? And I'm proud to see that that wall has changed and it speaks to why your contribution and so many others are so important because Victory has recognized that work. They're investing in those candidates. They're being intentional. So continue to give and also continue to give to Casa Ruby because I know Ruby Corrado and she does amazing work for LGBTQ youth in uh, 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 District of Columbia. In fact, when I was pushing for us to be, um, uh, for us to uh, be collecting data on LGBTQ homeless youth in Montgomery County, Ruby Corrado was one of the first people that came out to the council along with me to testify and to say, listen, we do not know how we can help our youth if we aren't collecting data on them. So I would say that both of those things are worthwhile uh, to put your dollars and also, it's important for us to understand that our money got to circulate in our community, right? So Ruby Corrado, Victory Fund, LGBTQ businesses, candidates, all of that is part of circulating our dollars and being intentional with it. Thank you for that, because I, I neglected to mention that, yeah, that, that volunteering is a great opportunity. But we also always have board members who, and, and sponsors who, who buy tables with this, uh, espr express intent that they be filled by folks who wouldn't otherwise be able to attend. And the way we find those folks, I mean, we, we reach out, uh, but a lot of times it's through our volunteer community, the, the cadre that comes and, and, and connects us to the, the, the broader community. So speak up and engage with us. There's always a way to get it done. Oh gosh, that made me think of another question, but I'm gonna ask this one first. Um, <laughs> so with the, Violent policies going on in, okay, I'm, I might say the company names wrong, but Brunei, is that right? Brunei, Brunei, Brunei. thank you. Um, and also with Crimea in the past and ongoing. Uh, and I know you guys Chechnya. are- Chechnya. Huh? Chechnya. Chechnya, oh boy. <laughs> um, thank you for knowing what I'm talking about. Um, I was curious, and I know you guys are in state legislatures. Um, I was just thinking about the ambassador earlier. And as someone who is in the US and we are growing more and more isolationist. Um, when I think about l queer family that is abroad, uh, I'm feeling a little bit hopeless on how to help or what to do. And I'm wondering if you guys have thought about that at all and if you in the state legislature or just as 
um, fellow US citizens have thought about like what we can start doing or what we can start advocating for because this administration um, is doing some pretty terrifying stuff to those folks. Change right the now. administration. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. true. <laughs> um, That's true. The, the, the answer is as multifaceted as the problem, right? And so I, I feel like I can address a couple of those issues. First and foremost, um, you know, I, I, I have similarly, I recently introduced legislation about PEP and PrEP. I just went on PrEP myself about a week ago. I will talk more about it to anybody that wants to talk to me about it. Um, but I, it, it's not enough to just talk about the lack of, of, of um, a availability or accessibility here in the country. It might cost you know, somebody in my same city $1,200 a week, nothing. But somebody across the planet doesn't even have access to it at all. These issues with Gilead, that the CDC developed this drug, that we are withholding it from people around the world, that it is life-saving medication, is something that we in the United States can do right now to impact this. We need to enforce the, the, the money that is owed to us as a community, that's owed to our government. We need to break these patents. We need to make sure that this life these life-saving drugs are available worldwide, and we in the United States can do that right now. Save the lives of a bunch of people that can advocate for themselves. So I'll add really quickly. Um, one is we can do something. Well, first is we have to build uh, an intersectional global movement that transcends borders. Um, understanding that our liberation is inextricably linked to the liberation of people that live in Brunei, Uganda, and so many other places. Um, and the moment we do that, uh, we are not just using our power and privilege, because we have privilege living in the United States here, um, albeit you know, not the, the, the best of laws for LGBTQ people, what we're changing, and we're changing perception compared to what a lot of our, um, uh, our, our queer sisters and brothers are experiencing in other countries. Uh, I will just cite one case. One is, I think, state legislatures and legislators can do something about what's going on in Brunei. Um, uh, I'll give an example. When uh, apartheid was taking place in South Africa, uh, the state of Massachusetts uh, passed uh, a law in essence um, uh, cutting ties with South Africa, the state government, any investments, dealings, et cetera. Uh, and that had such a profound impact at a time where we had a president who, uh, quite frankly, um, saw Nelson Mandela as a terrorist, as, 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 as did a number of other folks. But here it was uh, a state that was leading on an issue uh, that you would have never thought that states could do, but they were doing. And so I'm in the process of finding out if the state of Maryland has any relationships, business holdings, dealings with Brunei. Uh, and my goal is that next session to introduce legislation that cuts ties with uh, Maryland and uh, Brunei. So there, there are certainly things that we can do um, because I think there's precedent for it. Um, but yes, but to the larger point, we have to be building a global movement. And I think that's what uh, Victory Fund is doing. One of my good friends used to be director of international programs, Sheila uh, Isang and whatnot. But that's, that's part of the work that we need to do internationally as well um, and understanding that our liberation is inextricably linked to the, to, to the liberation of those uh, queer folks living in other countries. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up, and I was going to come back to it. Uh, Victory Fund is a PAC. Victory Institute is our C3, and we have an international program. And in fact, the director of our overall Victory Institute is somewhere. There he is, right on the front yeah. row. And uh, we are engaged in some of these countries. We are in South Africa. We are in India. We were in the Balkans, and we are in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, we have an, an, a Latin American Leaders Conference coming up in May in Colombia, and we're working very hard to help LGBT leaders into those political systems within their own countries. And uh, we also, in our annual Conference of Elected Officials that takes place either in November or December each year here in Washington, uh, we're the only international gathering of LGBT officials. And uh, you will, we work very hard to make sure that those in areas that are under attack have the opportunity to come raise awareness, advocate for themselves, and uh, help create the groundswell of change in those countries. But we're also doing it very deliberately and, and in a focused way. Uh, I've just gotten the high sign that we have to quit. But that doesn't mean we're leaving, uh, because there is a reception that we will join. I'm going to invite Ruben up, and he can, he's going to. Maybe I teed you up really well, Thank Ruben. You, Maybe we do rapid fire questions. 
So we, I think we, you all are going to stay for the reception, so people are welcome to uh, engage everyone in person uh, after this. Unfortunately, we're short on time, but it's even better to have a conversation over a glass of wine, right? <laughs> so uh, good evening, I'm Ruben Gonzalez. I'm the uh, Vice President of the LGBTQ Victory Institute, which is the uh, nonprofit C3 arm of Victory. On behalf of Mayor Anise Parker uh, and the Victory Institute team, I want to thank Dr. Michael Ulrich and the NYU Washington DC team, including Kevin Muehlman, for hosting us today. I also want to thank Sheila Alexander-Reed, Ambassador Guest, Representative Titone, Delegate Acevedo, and Representative Sims for taking time to be with us today and share their work and their powerful stories. Can we give them a big round of applause? <laughs> so we have a bit of an ask. I want to tee this up a little bit. The Stonewall Uprising was a galvanizing moment for the LGBTQ community in a number of ways, including the collective realization that the fate of our community is inextricably tied to the people we elect for office and place into important decision-making roles as public leaders. It's no surprise that one year after Stonewall, as pride marches started sprouting up across the country, that Frank Kameny, who had already founded the Washington branch of the Mattachine Society and had protested the exclusions of gays and lesbians in the federal government, launched a valiant, although unsuccessful, effort to run for Congress. He became the first openly gay person to run for office in the United States. Just five years after Stonewall, our community did see success as Kathy Kachasenko became the first openly LGBTQ person to win office in the United States, not in New York, not in California, but in Ann Arbor. Uh, and we've had so many historic firsts since then, so many here on the stage this morning, or today, this afternoon, which is why I also want to thank you for being here. At Victory Institute, we believe that representation is power. The idea that to achieve full equality, we must continue to elect LGBTQ people to public office. There are currently 682 people across the country that are out uh, across uh, offices. While that's the biggest number that we've ever had, it's the highest number it's ever been, it's only 1.1% of the total elected positions in the country. We actually need to elect about 20,000 more people across the country in order to get to sort of proportional representation for our community. So there's a lot of work to be done. This is where the ask comes in. So when asked about running for president, one of the candidates, and I'll give you a hint, it was a, uh, it was a cis straight white guy, said <laughs> that he felt like he was born to do this. He was born into it. Um, our community doesn't usually feel that way. And neither do uh, people of color and women. Usually don't feel they were born to be running for office or running for president. We often need to be asked multiple times to convince ourselves that we're not only qualified, but actually needed in these roles. This past Tuesday, Victory launched the first ever National Out to Win Day, where people can nominate their LGBTQ friends and colleagues to run for office. Now, I know nominating sounds a little bit intimidating, but what it actually was was just a way to provide a vehicle for people to ask their friends, people they knew that could do a great job in, in office, to run. And we all know people who should run. We have friends, family members, teachers, Loved ones, everyone should think about it. Uh, I think the people on the panel did a great job in sort of getting us to think about what are our areas of expertise? What are we really passionate about? So tonight I'm asking all of you to think about running for office. A future representative to tone, a future delegate Acevedo is likely in this room right now or watching on our live stream. And our country, actually the world needs you. So I encourage you to go to outtowin.org and take the pledge. You'll receive information from Victory on next steps that you should take as you consider a role in public leadership. Just last Tuesday, uh, people shared our Out to Win message over two million times across social media platforms, and thousands of people signed up on our website to learn more about how they can become a public leader. But we need more. We need you, we need your friends, we need everyone you know. Again, 20,000 people is what we need to get to. Each of the folks on our panel would love to be joined by you as they push for greater equality for LGBTQ people. So please help us spread the word, the word so that we can elect more out leaders to continue to build on the awesome work that they're all doing. Thank you, and please, one more round of applause for our panel. Thank you.